previous section we've discussed all the nine canons in great detail. Let's focus on the six canons which are relevant to taxpayers and analyze them for the current tax structure as well as GST. We know that India's tax structure can be broadly divided into two, direct tax and indirect tax and GST falls under indirect tax. So let's start our analysis for direct tax structure. All six canons are ticked in the case of direct tax. Direct tax follows a slab based system of taxation where there is a certain level below which all people are exempt from paying any tax. For businesses with turnover less than 2 crore, there is option to make complicated procedures absolutely easy as well as tax calculations are simplified. The direct tax is properly budgeted. The returns are needed to be filed only once per year and so there is not much of paperwork attached to direct taxation. And also because of the fact that it's only one law, it is easy to know where to refer in case of confusion which is not the case with indirect taxes where there are so many different laws that's in the current tax structure. And because of this, as you can guess, for indirect tax system which is in existence, most of the canons are not ticked. In fact, only one canon of certainty is ticked. Why? Because there is a prescribed rate of tax for all the taxes, there is a mechanism for payment of tax and obviously you know where to pay tax. All other canons are unticked because there are so many different taxes that it is not economical, convenient or simplified for any of the taxpayers to actually go pay tax. There is no equality as well. This except for the case of VAT where a small business is given an option to simplify the complications. None of the tax laws, indirect tax laws give that option to any of the small businesses. And expediency? Well, cascading effect is unfair taxation and so the canon of expediency is also not ticked. And this is exactly why the GST is coming into picture. To tick all of these canons to make life simple for the taxpayer and the composition scheme is going to help GST to fulfill this responsibility. Now, expediency, certainty and simplicity have all been picked because of reduced cascading effect and there's a prescribed rate of taxation in GST and of course because there's only three laws that you'll have to refer which are almost equal to each other and not the 14, 15, 16 different laws under the indirect tax structure in existence currently, life becomes much more simple. What about the other three? That's exactly where the composition scheme offered under the GST comes into picture. The driving force behind the composition scheme is to simplify procedural compliances for the taxpayer. Whether he'll save up on his tax expense or not, that is undecided. It's very subjective to each taxpayer. So the common point for anybody who opts into the composition scheme is simplified procedure for tax payment and compliance. So it makes sense that we start our discussion of composition scheme by looking into what is the process for a normal taxpayer, that is someone who does not opt into the composition scheme. There are four stakeholders involved in the entire process. There's of course the taxpayer, second his customers, his suppliers and fourth obviously the government. Four stakeholders and with all these stakeholders, the taxpayer will have to follow eight processes to comply with tax laws. First, he will have to collect tax from the customer at the prescribed rate, the rate prescribed by the government. Second, in return for collecting this tax from the customer, he will have to issue tax invoice. Third, from his supplier, he can claim input tax credit input tax credit on his purchases from his suppliers the fourth step the taxpayer paying the net tax net tax is equal to tax collected from the customer minus input tax credit claimed on his purchases he'll have to pay this net tax to the government 
Now remember, not every tax on his purchases will be allowed to be claimed as input credit, and so he'll have to do an elaborate tax computation to find out his net tax payable to the government. That brings us to the fifth step of maintaining elaborate books of accounts. He'll have to maintain records of his tax liability, tax collection, of every little detail, and that's why maintaining books of accounts would be a big task. Sixth, he'll have to undertake complex tax liability calculations because of involvement of input tax credit. Seventh, he'll have to appoint an entire team to perform accounting and tax work for him because. the processes are so complex if he himself is involved in complying with all these processes he might not have time to undertake his normal business operations and because he'll have to capture a lot of details which might not work out manually he'll have to invest in expensive systems technology he'll also have to get his books of account audited at the end of the year now this audit limit is for only certain category of tax payers but if that's so he'll have to get his books of accounts audited and he'll have to appoint an auditor for the same and eighth he'll have to file monthly returns to the government all these returns are very exhaustive and ask for a lot of details which have to be correct and for that again he'll have to appoint an other team or an expert to file monthly returns only and so all of this makes the process one very complicated and two probably expensive and this is precisely the reason why the canon of equality economy and convenience is absolutely not met in the current tax structure the processes make it so complicated that it is not at all convenient for the taxpayer